Hello, Pro Guides familia. Soy Rafa, and welcome back to another episode of Pro Guides Best Champions Domain, now for patch 11.16. The champions we pick for this series are strong picks with high performance but really low ban rates and are unlikely to be nerfed anytime soon. These are going to be reliable picks for climbing and are worth investing your time in. We also have a series that covers the most broken contested picks in each role, so be sure you're subbed to the channel so you don't miss out when we post those as well. We'll start things off in the top lane with Kale. Kale is maybe the champion that best fits the definition of a true hyper carry. She starts out the game pretty slow, being pretty weak and so weak to the point that she basically doesn't have a single winning lane pre-6. At that stage of the game, you'll try to pick up what farm you can, but don't worry if you're not able to get too much. Your main priority is surviving and reaching level 6. With your ranged form unlocked, things start to get a bit easier. You can safely secure most of the farm now, and you can trade with your opponent a bit more heavily. In fact, some lanes against opponents that can't really gap close that well, you may even become a bit of a bully at that point. But against the most OP picks like Camille and Riven, you'll still have to play with a bit of caution. They can easily take you down if they jump on you. But remember, you're playing a hyperscaling carry, so it's okay if you aren't winning this early in the game. Once you get to level 11 and have two full items done, then you will have hit your first relevant power spike. You can do most champs and have a decent impact in team fights, but things get really spicy when you hit level 16, kind of like Cassidy. The bonus range and permanently stacked passive allows you to carry fights extremely hard. By the time you reach this point, you should be at or near your Rabidots and your autos will completely melt the enemy team. If you're tired of being stuck in your current elo, the first step to climbing is fixing your champion pool. That's why we make these videos so you can find the right champ or champs for you. After you decide on what you're going to play, then you have to learn how to play it right. It can take many, many hours worth of games to learn a new champion, but you don't have to spend days and weeks doing it alone. We have courses from all of your favorite streamers and pros like CoreJJ from Team Liquid, Afromu from Dignitas, and XMiffy to help you really understand how to play your role. And if you want a more personalized one-on-one -on -one experience, our top tier coaches are available 24-7 to help you anytime you want it. Whichever option you choose, stop spinning your wheels on your own and get on the fast track to hire ELO today. Now, if Kale style isn't for you, maybe you'll like Quinn. Instead of farming it out and ramping up, Quinn is an incredibly strong lane bully right off the bat, able to zone most lane opponents from the wave as early as level 1. There are plenty of annoying ranged top laners, but none of them are as reliable of a pick as Quinn. Pretty much no champion can out trade Quinn early on. Any opponent that tries to close the gap is met with an E, halting whatever dash or jump they are trying to use to close the distance and sending you back to safety. For being such a strong defensive ability, it has a pretty low cooldown, only 12 seconds on rank one. Compare that to Vayne, who has to wait 20 seconds between each condemn. In the times where Vault alone isn't enough to keep you safe, you also have your Q. The nearsightedness debuff that you give your opponents from being hit makes it completely impossible for them to trade back. One more thing, most other ranged bully top laners don't have that much utility outside of the laning phase, so if they fall behind, they're completely useless. Thankfully for Quinn, her ultimate ability gives her insane roaming potential that allows you to start influencing the map even before the laning phase ends. Since it also has no cooldown, you can even roam to mid lane or invade the enemy jungle and make it back to lane without really having to give up any CS. If you're efficient with your roams, you'll be able to influence the map without having to sack your farm. A third top laner for this patch is Lowey. She's got a bit of a higher skill floor than most other champions in the lane since missing her E leaves her pretty vulnerable to being punished. But once you learn how to use her right, she can win just about any matchup in top lane with pretty much no champion in the game being able to fight her post 6 if you're able to pull out their soul. Thankfully, Alawi is a pretty rare sight, so most opponents you play against won't really have a lot of practice playing against her. Not knowing how to deal with her means your lane opponent will likely try to play back, but this is exactly what you want. If you're pushing your opponent under tower, this gives you free shots with your E. Worst case scenario, if you miss, and then you're free to back up. If you land it, you're taking away a huge chunk of your opponent's HP without even being in turret range. One really nice thing about Alawi, I think that any top laner would appreciate, is how good she is at dealing with jungle pressure. In the first few levels, she's just as prone to dying ganks as anyone else, but once you have your ultimate leap of faith, more targets actually makes it easier to win a fight. Just remember, it's crucial that you land your E if you're going to take on a 1v2. 
not only does the soul count as an extra target and therefore an extra tentacle from your ult, but it causes all of your tentacles to swing an extra time. And combined with all the physical vamp that you are getting, it's what makes Alawi such a difficult champion to kill when Leap of Faith is available. As the game goes on, Alawi is one of those champions where you always want to play your game. In this case, that means constantly split pushing. Alawi is more than capable of fighting multiple enemies at the same time. In fact, in an ideal scenario, you can literally 1v5, but this is easily done on your terms. If you're splitting, you have tentacles already set up in your area, and your opponents will be coming to you. If you try to group up and do a Baron or a Dragon Dance, it's a lot easier for the enemy team to kite you around, and you're essentially useless. So stick to the sidelines. Your opponents will need to send multiple chance to deal with you anyway, so your team should be able to get something done in the meantime on the other side of the map. Taking a look now at some junglers, our first pick is Nunu. Riot has had one consistent theme in balance this season. Take a champion with a 52% win rate and buff it. Yeah, let's let's ignore the champs suffering at the bottom of the performance rates. No big deal. And buff champs that are already in the A tier. And Nunu was one of those picks for this patch. What makes it even more confusing is it's not like Nunu is some champion like Camille or Riven who tend to do better when the player has mastered them. Nunu is a very easy champion, so he's already accessible to players from Iron all the way to Challenger. But hey, we'll take what they give us, right? More movement speed means a little bit of an easier time sticking to people. Not that that was really an issue with Blue Smite, Phase Rush, and your E, but it's all good. The AP buff to his E does mean that you get a little bit more value out of offensive items. It's pretty popular to go Magi's on Nunu when you're doing well and snowballing, so no pun intended. Feel free to buy an early Dark Seal and upgrade it if the game is going well. If you really want to be more of a damage threat, you could even pick up a Demonic Embrace after your Dead Man's Plate. Our second jungler is Rek'Sai. With how OP early game junglers have been since the change way back on 11.7, it's natural that Rek'Sai can be another pick that you can add to your pool. Her early ganks rival those of other early game champions like Zin Zhao and Volibear. Honestly, I'd say they're even better since you can tunnel over a wall from any angle, making it impossible to fully ward against her, and she has a point and click knockup, so once you're behind an opponent, they're guaranteed to be hit up. And it's not just her ganks that make her strong early. She's a super strong duelist, able to bring down most opponents pretty fast with her combo. If you really want to play for the early game, you can even swap out Conqueror Page for Halo Blades so that you can quickly build up your auto attacks and fury so you can get the max damage out of your Furious Bite. As the game goes on, most people would say Rek'Sai falls off, and that's pretty true to some extent. But it's not that her damage goes downhill, it's just hard to reach targets when both teams are grouped up and dancing around objectives. Her tunnel is just really telegraphed, and any disengage will stop her from reaching the back line. That's why, once the game reaches those later stages, you'll constantly have to play around making picks, whether that's catching opponents in side lanes or catching those trying to rotate through the jungle trying to establish vision. And speaking of vision, the vision game is extremely important with Rek'Sai. Thanks to your passive, you will have a lot more information than other junglers without the need for control wards, but it's still good to stock up on them just to give you even more control of those choke points. Our final jungler for this patch is Warwick. While his early game presence isn't quite as high as other popular picks at the moment, it's a pretty worthwhile trade-off for what he brings to the table. For one, there's his dueling strength. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of junglers we talked about that have strong dueling capabilities, but when it comes to Warwick, it's just a completely other level. His ability to 1v1 any other champion in the game is completely unmatched. And you don't even need crazy mechanics or mechanics at all really to pull it off. All the fighting strength just comes from his passive and his Q. Basically, just auto attack and use Q on cooldown. And you can't lose a fight to anyone in the early stages of the game, combined with the extra attack steroid speed buffs from your passive, as well as the healing and the max HP damage you get from your Q. Warwick is just absolutely nuts in 1v1s. The one part about Warwick's skill expression can come from your timing of your E, for the fear, but in the early fights, you don't even need it for 1v1s. In fact, you probably can just win most of them with auto attacks and Qs alone. And to be fair, before the Warwick mains come and flame me in the comment section, you also have some skill expression in making sure you time your Q to follow people as it will follow through flash and any mobility or dashes as well. This overwhelming ability makes it impossible to be bullied by any other jungler. You're never at risk of dying to invasions and you should never lose a Scuttlecrab fight unless enemy laners have something to do with it. As the game goes on, you want to constantly look for 1v1s and small skirmishes as much as you can. Warwick's strong fighting power never really falls off, but in 5v5s, there's a higher chance of your ulti being interrupted, and you're a lot more prone to being kited. Next up for the mid lane, we'll start things off with Heimerdinger. 
The mid lane meta for most of this season has been pretty heavily dominated by the very scary and punishing the lane against Assassins and AD champions. And while Heimer may not look that imposing, he's actually one of the best counterpicks to the oppressive champions in that class. Heimer is really good at shoving waves thanks to his turrets. Other mages may be able to deal with his turrets by either matching their pushing power or killing them all together. But for melee champions, neither of this is really an option. They definitely can't match the pushing power, and if they try to walk up to the turrets, you can just hit them with your grenade, and they take about half of their HP bar. Going in on you isn't exactly an option either, since you'll punish them with the exact same combo. Their only choice is to let you push in, but then they're open to your rocket poke under tower. Basically, you're just establishing total lane control and neutralizing everything they want to do. The one tip is to pretty much never try to use your E offensively. Throwing out the grenade may lead to a hard hitting combo, but if your opponent is a mobile assassin, they can likely dodge it. And then you have opened up the opportunity for them to start an all in on you. So use it as a defensive option. Our second mid laner is Ari. In most metas, Ari tends to be a bit of a so-so pick. She falls right between the identity of being a mage and an assassin, and usually you're just better off picking off a champ that specializes in one of two directions. But with standard control mages being at an all-time low, she's risen up as one of the best mages you can pick in mid lane this season. She offers the wave clear and consistent lane phase that other champions in the class of a mage bring, but also has the super high burst damage to keep up with the other assassins in the meta. She's also super safe when dealing with other assassins compared to champions like Orianna and Syndra instead. They have no ability, nor can they hope to match the all-in damage of someone like Zed or Katarina, so they're pretty easy to farm for kills. But as Ari, if an assassin jumps in on you, it's pretty hard for them to dodge a point-blank charm. This makes it pretty easy to win most trades, and if they keep going, committing fully with their ults, you can respond with your own in Spirit Rush, kiting them out, dodging skill shots, and even turning the fight back on them once they run out of their cooldowns. Outside of lane phase, Ari provides a solid amount of wave clear, but you aren't just splitting down towers with her. You should be out pushing waves and immediately roaming to make picks. In team fights, you can use her ult to dash for walls and look for flanks taking out the enemy backline, but you're just as capable as being a front to back fighting mage as well, making use of your true damage through your orb of deception to melt the beefy frontliners. Our last mid laner is Annie. And if you want something simple and sweet, then this will be the pick for you. Annie's design really hasn't changed too much since her release in the very early days of League of Legends, but she's by no means power crept by the modern day champions in the game, despite a feeling like you're playing a season one champ. In fact, maybe it's because she's so simple that she works so well. Laning phase is a breeze because trades are really easy with her point and click Q and W combo. Just make sure you're weaving in an auto attack to proc electrocute as well. Even farming is made insanely easy with Annie as each last hit with Q refunds mana and half the cooldown. And on top of being easy to play, she's also a super safe pick. Between her stun and her shield, you can easily walk away from trades you don't want to take. Once you're level six, you go from strong trading power to high burst kill potential. Even a full HP opponent can be 100 to zero by your combo if you have ignite available. If your lane opponent is playing too far back, go for a roam. With all of your easy to land bursts and CC, even slightly overextended opponents are pretty much guaranteed kills. Outside of laning phase, it's not exactly rocket science to figure out what to do. Your main goal is to group up and land the biggest tippers ult possible. Most burst mages want to reach squishy backliners, and doing so with Annie means you're likely going to wipe out a target or two with your opening combo. But don't feel like that's your only option, because Annie's burst is just ridiculous to the point that you can almost one shot or at least do a bunch of damage to beefier bruisers and juggernauts. So if your flash is down, you don't need to try and find some flank to reach the back line. Just swap to front to back fighting mode and you'll be just fine. Moving things down to the bottom lane, our first pick is Sivir. She's another champion in the category of already doing decent, but we'll buff her anyways. The weird part about this buff is that it's targeting Sivir's late game. If you go the crit build on her, Sivir already has a good late game. So now she'll just be dishing out even more damage in those 5v5s where her ricochets are allowed to bounce through the entire enemy team. Individual carrying strength aside, there's also Sivir's ultimate. While it may not be the same type of engage as an Ash Crystal Arrow or a Varus Chain of Corruptions, the ability to speed up your entire team with On the Hunt can be a much better form of enabling with the right composition. The ability to speed up someone like an Olaf or a Hecarim, for example, can be exactly what you need to help tie your team composition that much better. 
On top of being so strong later, Sivir's already a solid laner as well. She may not have any mobility spells to help her get out of danger or be able to dash in for a kill, but it's still hard for most opponents to punish you. For one, once you have a few levels and a bit of AD, you can shove in waves extremely fast, leaving very little time for interaction with your opponent. What few windows they do have and try and go in, you can deny with a well-timed spell shield. Our second bot carry for you is Kog'Maw. If you want it to be an insanely strong scaling carry in the bottom lane, then Kog'Maw is your champion. But being such a hyperscaling champion doesn't just mean that you're a pushover in lane phase, because honestly, when you trade around your W, you're one of the strongest 2v2 marksmen you can play with. Kog'Maw's reach and damage are just too much to deal with, especially once you max it out for a full extra 210 attack range. One thing, obviously, is that you have a certain window of trading the fight around now. So don't just waste the cooldown to get in a single auto attack on your opponent, because otherwise this will just leave you open to being engaged on for the next several seconds. You should be using W when the other bot lane is trying to pick a fight, or your support goes for a trade and you can get a full value of a few auto attacks in. Then, once it's down, you gotta back up and avoid fighting at all costs until you have it again. Once you get your ultimate in bio arcane barrage laning phase becomes a lot easier especially if it's a bottom lane that doesn't have reliable engage but don't spam it for one the ramping mana cost will cle quickly leave you out of mana two it doesn't do a whole lot of damage if your opponent has high hp then you have to wait until you get them under 40 percent hp which then will cause the damage to do double since it's execution damage then you can use it to go for a poke every time the stacking debuff falls off in team fights, your lack of mobility basically means you're just trying to mow down your opponents before they reach you. Your ease slow helps a lot in that regard, as does orb walking if you're good at that. But the most important thing is your positioning. Set up near your support and behind whatever front line you have and just front to back, baby. Never over chase for the kill. Just let the front line do the work for you and you will literally be spitting out damage. Our final bot carry is Vigar. Vigar works way better as a bot laner than he does mid, simply due to the lower threat nature of the role. Sure, there are still kill lanes with champions like Draven, Tristana, Leona, and Nautilus, but his cage can completely stop their engage attempts since those champions don't have blinks like Zed or Katarina. On top of that, playing bot lane with a support means he has someone to set him up to land his combo. This makes it a lot easier to come online as Vigar. In mid lane, you're usually farming for a good portion of the game, since it's pretty easy for opponents to just shove the wave and ignore you. Now, if you're laning with an aggressive support in the bottom lane, you can start going for all-ins as soon as you get your ultimate. It's as simple as setting up your cage to prevent your opponent from running anywhere, and your support moving in and landing whatever crowd control they have. Then you delete the target. Wash, rinse, repeat. Out of lane, you may lack mobility, but again, thanks to your cage, it'll be pretty hard for most threats to reach you. Vigar's full combo can delete just about any champion that gets too close, so anyone that runs into said Event Horizon is usually the one that ends up dead. In teamfights, you'll play things kind of slow. While you are a burst mage, you never ever want to flash in and try to take out the other carries, unless you're feeling like a chad. Play it front to back, spamming your cage to manipulate the enemy team. If someone gets caught out, boom, bam, bop. Blow them up. Don't be shy about ulting frontline bruises and juggernauts either, or even tanks, because as you get a lot of passive attacks over time, and once you get two or three items, you won't even need your ult for even killing squishier targets. Q and W will just be enough for the backline, and your ulti will be able to kill some frontline members as the game goes on. Non-traditional bot lane picks like Mages, Yasuo, Aurelia often show up with high win rates, but really low play rates. The majority of ADC mains just seem to refuse to pick them up. And that brings us to today's question of the day. Do you think off meta picks are a fun, healthy part of the game, or are they a sign that certain champions and roles are either too weak or too strong? For me, off meta picks are super awesome for the game from a spectator standpoint, and sometimes it's best for the health of the game so that you can push the boundaries of what traditional roles and champions would normally be suited best for. But that's just my opinion. I wanna see what you guys think in the comment section below. Now, let's talk about supports. If you want to completely dominate lane and go for more of a carry build than a uh, traditional support at later stages of the game, then you should really try Zyra. When I say she dominates lane, I, I mean she dominates lane. There's literally no viable consistent counter to Zyra in the current meta. Against enchanters, you completely take away any chance of them playing in the lane. If they ever try to trade on you, you're returning the damage two or even threefold even in the first few levels. Once you have ulti and stranglethorns, you can 100 to 0 burst them if you land your root. Even Lulu, who we consider the best all-around support in the game, is completely useless against Zyra. 
And then there's engage supports. Obviously, you're playing Zyra with a weak ADC like Ezreal, you're going to get run over by strong kill lanes. But if you have an ADC that can pressure with you like Ash, Caitlyn, Draven, you can constantly push in laners that would look to engage on you. Poking them out early on leaves them too low to ever really look to fight, so you're totally neutralizing what they're trying to do. Out of lane, the combination of Leandries and Demonic Embrace makes every little Thorn Spitter auto attack do a pretty considerable amount of poke, making Zyra an incredibly frustrating champion to play against when you start to siege with her. But it's not like your opponents can just run you down, since doing so means having to run through your Strangle Thorns and all of the plants that it empowers. Now don't worry, Enchanter fans, we do have a pick for you too with the best fish around in Nami. When it comes to champions in that class, she's the absolute best pick for dominating lane. That's pretty much entirely thanks to her W, Surging Tides, with it providing both a lot of sustain and poke. If you're able to land good Ws that bounce to hit the maximum of three targets consistently, you are basically will be able to 1v2 the opposing bot lane. Her E also goes really well with ADCs that can make the most out of it. Ash with Halo Blades, for example, can easily get off three auto attacks quickly. Then there's Vayne. The three empowered hits go well with her pattern of trading with Silver Bolt's three hit proc. Nami's Q can also be pretty hard to use offensively since it's pretty slow and easy to dodge. Instead, you'll want to use it more reactively to prevent your opponent's engage. Nami's ult is arguably the hardest to use properly of any enchanter. That's because it's not just some instant buff heal or peel like the rest of them. The slow moving tidal wave is easy to dodge if you just randomly throw it out. But if you use it at the right time, in the right place, it can have a huge impact in fights. You sort of want to think of it as a Seraphine ult. It's best used to follow up on an ally's engage or to disrupt the enemy team when they're the ones looking to engage on you. You also find it a lot easier to use effectively if you take a fight in a choke point since then, there's nowhere for the enemy to run once you throw out that giant tidal wave. As for our build, we suggest Imperial Mandate because of how well it works with Nami Z, but all three mythics are pretty viable. If you feel strongly about one being better than the others, explain why down in the comment section below. And finishing off of our list, we have Rel. Rel is for the support main who wants to guarantee their composition has the crowd control and frontline needed to have a strong team fight. Plenty of champions are full of disruption, but Rel has them all beat. What's so good about her is that you just don't engage or peel with her. You can do both at the same time thanks to her E, Attract and Repel. You can W right through into the enemy team with Pharomancy, hit a huge ulti, and then with your Attract and Repel tethered to one of your backliners, you can then stun any target that gets past you and tries to reach your backline. Another thing that puts her ahead of other disruptors is her engage tools. Her W's knockup and her ulti are unaffected by tenacity, so you can reliably keep the targets that Rel reaches completely locked down. So not even QSS or Cleanse is going to help an immobile target escape her lockdown. As bonus points, Rel is also a rare case of a melee taking engage support that can provide sustain in lane. It's not a lot, but hitting multiple Qs can really add up over the course of the lane phase. So even when you aren't able to play her super aggro, you at least provide something to your lane partner. And pro guys from India, that is going to be it for our top three champs of main on 11.16 for every single role. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to sub so you never miss out on our meta guides and you're always in the loop on what the best picks are. Remember to let us know how you feel about off meta picks down in the comment section below. And one last thing, don't forget to check out our discord in the description box below where you can discuss leak further or just hang out and be part of our awesome community. I can't wait to see you guys back for the next video, but until then, Good luck on the rift, stay safe, stay healthy, wash those hands, and have fun out there. Adios!